Something I've learned over the span of my lifetime is uh, there are three words that I've come to love and cherish, and I'll put them up on the screen for you here. They are, you are forgiven. I don't think I can hear those words enough because they assure you and me that we will never have to pay the ultimate price for the sins that we've committed. We'll never have to pay the ultimate price for all the mess-ups, the mishaps, the, the, the boo-boos, the evil deeds that we've done, whether intentional or unintentional. And these words, you are forgiven, remind us of what Jesus Christ did for us, where he paid the ultimate price by taking our sins and nailing them to the cross. And the thing about our Savior Jesus is he knows full well that you and I need to hear these words over and over and over again. And that's why in his love, he gave to the church two very special gifts that he instituted prior to going back to heaven. And we call those two gifts sacraments, or in another way, uh, this word means holy things. And, and what defines a sacrament in our church is something that God has commanded, that Jesus specifically said we should do, that's connected to an earthly element and also to his word. And last week we talked about the first uh, sacrament, which is holy baptism. And the, the earthly element connected to that is what? Water, right? And when we apply that water to an individual, the words that Jesus gave us to say are, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which then imparts the name of our triune God over everyone who receives that amazing gift. And what we're also told is that when you are baptized into God's name, your sins are washed away, you are forgiven, your sins are nailed to the cross, and you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we learned last time in Romans 6, then declares that you and I are no longer slaves to sin, which means you don't have to sin anymore. That's pretty awesome. Now, will you be tempted? Yes. Can you fall into that temptation? Yes. But do you have to? No. And that is the gift of baptism that God gives to us. So that's the first sacrament. And, and, and what makes that sacrament so powerful is that it is connected to Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb. That's where baptism gets its power from. The other sacrament that Jesus gave to his church has multiple names. Sometimes it's called communion. Sometimes it's called holy communion. Sometimes it's referred to as the Lord's Supper. Sometimes it's called the Eucharist. Have you heard that one? You know where that comes from? Greek. I'm going to teach you some Greek today. The word Eucharist means Thanksgiving in Greek. Okay, so that's why it's referred to that. And we're going to see that today in, in, in our, our lesson. And so what, what I'd like to do today is to walk through where communion came from, its origin story, and then talk about how it applies to you and to me. What are the benefits for us as we partake in this Holy Supper? So to do that, we're going to be opening our Bibles, and you can do that. There's, there's Bibles in your pews there. Um, Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. We're going to be looking at verse 17. Um, otherwise, everything is printed out in your bulletin for your convenience, but if you'd like to, to open the book and, and, and look there, uh, you can go there. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 17. And this is what it says. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. So what this is teaching us is that communion is directly correlated with the festivals of unleavened bread and the Passover meal. Now, unleavened bread, that is bread without leaven. And if you're not a cook, leaven is yeast. Yeast is the, the stuff that you put in there that, that causes bread to rise. And bread that has yeast in it will only last for a certain amount of time. If you don't put the yeast in there, the consistency of that bread then is, is more like a cracker. And, and that's something that, that can last the test of time. You're not going to necessarily use it for uh, making your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So both the, the festival of unleavened bread and the Passover were holidays that God had commanded his people to commemorate. And this is what the Jewish people had celebrated for centuries. Now, earlier we discussed in the Bible reading today how the, these festivals came about, but I'm, I'm going to review that for you right now. So the Israelites were in the land of Egypt for 430 years. In captivity, they were slaves to the Egyptians. 
They were super oppressed. They weren't free to do whatever they wanted to. Uh, it was horrible. And so they cried out to God. God hears their cry for help, and he, dis- he decides to send them the prophet Moses. And, and pr- the prophet Moses has a very interesting story. Uh, he was a Jewish man who grew up in Pharaoh's palace. So Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. And the way that happened was one day Pharaoh's daughter was down in the Nile River bathing, and all of a sudden this basket floats up, and she's like, what, what is going on there? She opens it up, and there's a baby inside of this basket. And he's a cute little baby. She falls in love with him, and she adopts him right then and there, and she calls him Moses, which means drawn out of the water. So his, his name is very specific there. So he gets to grow up in the king's palace, learning the Egyptian language, learning all their cultural norms, which is good for the guy who's going to come and save his people from the Egyptians. But, but it was much more than just him having those experiences. God was behind Moses. And God allowed Moses to perform all these great miraculous signs, which we now know as plagues. And the first plague God told uh, Moses to enact, to get Pharaoh to let God's people go, to set them free, was he went to the Nile River and he struck it with his staff and it turned to blood which if you think about it, is really disgusting. So they were not able to drink water from that. Then from there, God said, I want you to send frogs over the land. Now it's fun, every boy grows up, maybe some girls too, like playing with a frog. Like one frog is fun, but not when they're coming and jumping out of your cupboards, right? That's pretty disgusting. Then he, he sends these gnats and flies upon the land. Um, have you ever seen those, just these, this little ball of blackness of gnats, and then all of a sudden you run through it, and you're like, it's in your ears and your nose and your eyes, and it's, it's like, it's disgusting, it's horrible, and you're just, you can't get them out fast enough, and then you're done. Well, imagine everywhere there's gnats and flies swarming you, coming into your ears and nose. This, this is the plague that's going on. Then on top of that, another plague was that all their livestock uh, had died from horrible diseases. The people were inflicted with painful boils. Um, Then uh, any crops that had remained were destroyed by uh, hail and locusts, which we know as grasshoppers. And and then God sent this this intense darkness for three days. Uh, Imagine you're driving along and you hit fog at night. Has that ever happened to you? Where even your flashers are on and nobody can see it? That fog was denser than that. The, the darkness was de- denser than that. They could not see even their hand in front of their face for three full days, which is kind of scary. So this is all happening. There, there, there's these nine times that God sends these plagues upon the land through his prophet Moses. And each time Pharaoh pleads for mercy, says, please take them all away. And, and when you do, I'll let your people go. So Moses prays to God, says, please remove these plagues. God removes them. And each and every time, Pharaoh says, ah, just kidding. I'm not going to let them go. Which wasn't very wise because God is super patient, way patient, more, more patient than any of us are. And yet Pharaoh had gotten to the point where he pushed God past his limit. And that's when God declared that he would send one last final plague, the tenth plague, the plague over the firstborn. And God knew that this one was going to push Pharaoh over the edge, and he was finally going to let God's people go. And so he told them, I want you to prepare bread without yeast, unleavened bread. I want you to make this cracker bread so that you can eat it in haste. You don't have time for it to rise, and you need to take it with you on your journey. He said, I want you to do that. And he said, every household needs to take a a male one-year-old lamb without blemish, without defect, and prepare it for a meal for your family. I want you to eat it together. If there's any leftovers, you need to burn it in the fire. But while you're eating it, you have your sandals on, your cloak tucked into your belt, and your staff in your hands so that you are ready to go at a moment's notice. The final instruction that God gave to the Israelite nation was that they were to take some blood of that lamb and paint it on the doorposts of their homes. That evening, they were to stay inside under the protection of the blood because God was going to send his destroying angel. Now, every time the destroying angel saw the blood, he would pass over the home, hence the name Passover. That's where that comes from. But if there wasn't the blood of the lamb on their house, that house would be under a curse. And the firstborn child and animal would die. So on that night of the first Passover, the Lord struck down the firstborn of 
Every Egyptian, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of a prisoner who was stuck in a dungeon. The sounds of crying were so loud that evening because there was not an Egyptian home where someone did not die. Immediately following that tenth plague, Pharaoh begged the Israelites to get out of Egypt. He finally set them free. And God made it so that all the Egyptians were, treated the, the Israelites favorably. They gave them food. They gave them provisions. They gave them clothing. They gave them silver and gold and all kinds of amazing things for their travels. That is how God miraculously set his people free. That's how he liberated them. And so he wanted them to commemorate this Independence Day year after year, teaching generation after generation about his power and about his salvation for his people. And that's where it came about that they would celebrate the Festival of Unleavened Bread and the Passover meal. And so this would last normally seven days. They would not work during those seven days, kind of like our spring break, but instead they, they wouldn't uh, travel on vacation, but they would go to Jerusalem with their families to gather together to remember what God had done for them. That's what's going on as Jesus gathers with his disciples who he viewed as his family. These were the people that were closest to him. They're together celebrating the festival of unleavened bread and the Passover. They were celebrating their independence. Now Matthew, we're looking at his book right now, he was one of the disciples who was with them on that day. He was in that room, and so he gives us an insider's look to what's going on. And, and he, he tells us right away that Jesus, during their conversation around the food, uh, brings up an unexpected topic that took everyone by surprise. This is what, what happens. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. So imagine, they're, they're all sitting around, they're all friends with Jesus, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And it says they were all sad. They legitimately did not know. They couldn't have pinpointed someone who, who was going to do that. And so they, they were all self-reflecting and asking, is it me? You don't mean me, Lord, do you? And I appreciate that about the, the disciples because they didn't always have this kind of humble attitude. More often than not, they were fighting about who's going to be the first in the kingdom of God. But here they actually were doing some uh, introspective looking into their own hearts. And it reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, he wrote, If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Meaning, don't let your pride trick you into thinking that you would never betray the Lord. Or that you would never sin in a certain way. Or, or that you're not susceptible uh, to temptations. Because the reality is, we, we are all under spiritual attack every single day. And we need to hum be humble enough to, to recognize that we could sin just as bad as anybody else. But, by the grace of God, we can resist the devil and his temptations. That's why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Unfortunately, though, the disciples who first learned that prayer, at least one of them, was not praying it, was not saying, lead me not into temptation. He goes on. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. All four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us that Judas was the one who would betray Jesus. But in that moment, sitting around the table, Everyone was ignorant of that. They were all clueless. They didn't know who it was. And so as they were reclining at this table, the, the other disciples had no clue who was going to backstab their Savior. And, 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 but prior to all this, Judas had already gone and talked with the authorities, told them that he would be willing to hand Jesus over when nobody else was around and so that he could receive 30 silver coins. Now, 
the thing is, um, when Jesus said, I'll go back here, uh, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me, it almost gives the, the indication that um, somebody's got their hand in the bowl as he says that, and, and you know, Jesus is like, oh, what? <laughs> but, but the gospel writers say they didn't, they didn't know that. So Jesus wasn't pointing that out. All he was saying is that somebody who is close to me, it, who has, has supped with me, who has eaten with me, someone who I, I love is going to betray me. And see, this was a big deal because in, in the Jewish culture, uh, you did not eat with people that you did not get along with. You did not eat with people that you did not agree with. And, and this is why the, the Pharisees were constantly mad at Jesus. They were always enraged every time he went to the feast of a tax collector or a sinner because in their minds, Jesus was affirming their sinful lifestyle, which he never did. He just loved these people, and, when, and he would point out their sins very clearly. But in their culture, if you ate with somebody, you're their buddy. So again, Jesus was saying in general, someone who has eaten with me is going to betray me. And that was Judas. And the thing is, Judas had a problem. He battled with the temptation of greed. And, and he hadn't been praying, Lord, lead me not into this temptation. D deliver me from this, me from this, liberate me from this. And instead, he fed that temptation by giving into it. See, he was in charge of the offerings. They, they would receive offerings to help them with their travel costs, um, lodging, food, and he was in charge of keeping track of that. Well, we find out later that he, he had um, sticky fingers. He, he loved to take a little bit for himself. A little bit for God, a little bit for me. A little bit for God, a little bit for me. And by doing that, he allowed that greed to overwhelm him where he got to the point where he loved money and he despised Jesus. As John tells us in his gospel, Judas' greed uh, left him spiritually vulnerable and susceptible to the devil's promptings. And that's why before that evening, Judas went to the chief priests and offered to hand Jesus over to them for 30 silver coins. So earlier I was telling you how the Israelite nation had been enslaved to their captors. Here, Judas represents another kind of slavery slavery to sin. And just like Judas, we are all susceptible to taking our friendship with Jesus for granted. It's possible for us to just put on a show and pretend we're, we're team Jesus, that when we're around people, we'll say very godly things, we'll quote the Bible, we'll go to all the church functions, but in our heart of hearts, we don't believe. That, that is possible. And, and we're also bombarded every single day with this lie that if, if, we, if we just had a little bit more money, or maybe just even a little bit more than that, and just to be sure, have a, just a little bit more than that to feel secure and happy, then, then we're, we'll be okay. And if, if, if you live in that mindset, and before you know it, people you love and, and care for, they're gonna be put on the back burner because money has come to the forefront, and you've neglected them, and you've neglected God. And the question is, could that actually realistically happen to any one of us? And the answer is yes. Have you ever worried about money because you didn't know how you're going to pay your bills or how you're going to make the next car payment or how you're going to pay for that vacation coming up or how you're going to continue to fund your retirement plan? But instead of running to your Heavenly Father and praying for peace, for patience, for contentment, for help, you came up with some crazy scheme to, to get the money in a way you know wasn't right? Have you ever praised God in one minute and then in the next breath you broke a commandment? Any of these things can happen to us. Every single day you and I struggle with the temptations that tug at our hearts. Every day we can easily be enslaved to our sinful selves. And that's why you and I need Jesus because he is the only one who can offer us spiritual independence. Just like the, the Israelites needed the Passover, we need something bigger than the Passover. And that's what Jesus offered his disciples in that moment at that table on that evening. Check this out. He said this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, would you read it with me? Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Read this. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So remember, they've been practicing. They've been celebrating the Passover for centuries. All these guys, little on up, they had been going to these meals where they would sit down, they'd have the bitter herbs, they'd have the lamb around the table, and then there was always a script that they would follow. Every portion of the meal was divided up, and, and so the head of the household would read certain passages and talk about certain happenings, and, and all of a sudden, Jesus goes off script, way off script. Now, just imagine how this must have felt for the disciples. Um, we use the, the new version, quote unquote, new version of the Lord's Prayer. Um, if you're used to the old version, and can you remember the first time you said the new version with us and all of a sudden your brain goes, what? <laughs> what? Where's the these and the thous? What happened? Right? So multiply that by a billion. Jesus doesn't say anything that's on the script. And he says, here's the bread. Take it, eat it. This is my body. What? Gives him the cup. He says, take and drink. This is my blood. What? What, what is going on? What, what are you saying, Jesus? All of a sudden, he's, he's telling them that the Passover meal that they've been celebrating for years upon years was always pointing ahead to him. And notice What's, what's the main dish of any Passover meal? Shout it out. Lamb. lamb. Is there any mention of lamb here? No. Here's why. Because the lamb, the true lamb of God, is sitting at the table with the disciples. And the lamb of God says, take and eat. This is my body. This is my blood for you. The Israelites had to paint their, their doorposts with the blood of the lamb so that God's wrath would pass over them, so that they could be freed from their slavery. Well, Jesus said, I am the lamb, and tomorrow I'm going to shed my blood on that cross. It will be painted on those posts so that anyone who looks at me will be liberated, will have their independence day their freedom from sin, their forgiveness, their, their, their phrase that pays, that, that three-word phrase that we all love to hear, you are forgiven. That's what Jesus was doing on this day, instituting this amazing supper that for centuries had always pointed ahead to him. And now communion has taken over, taken the place of the Passover meal. And the beauty is, that blood that Jesus shed covers over all the times that you and I have been posers, where we, we pretended to follow Jesus, but we weren't really into it, where we had a, a form of godliness but denied God's power. The blood that Jesus shed for, was for all the times that we allowed greed and the love of money to invade our hearts. Jesus came to set you and me free from all of that so that we could truly have a friendship with him, to truly have that connection, that independence. And so he gave us this miraculous meal to constantly draw us back to that moment, that moment where he shed his blood on the cross so that in a very personal way, and this is so, I, I say this all the time, you know, it's very easy when I say, you are forgiven, and, and, you're, and you go, I think they're forgiven. I don't know about me. I don't know if that phrase applies to me. But when you, when you receive God's body, and you receive his blood, and you take it in, and you hear those words, you are forgiven, it's pretty hard to say, no, oh, that's not for me. <laughs> It's such a beautiful gift that God gives to his church to give us that amazing assurance that we need to hear in various forms, in our baptism, in, in the spoken word, in, in the supper. And, and notice that he says, my blood of the, what is that word? Covenant. He says, this is my promise, guys. Can God break his promises? 
And so he says, this is my promise to you. I forgive you. And if he forgives you, then you know what you can do? You can forgive yourself. Yesterday I was at a pastor's or a conference in, in New Orleans, Minnesota, and, and the other pastor, presenter, and I talked a lot about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And, and a gentleman came up to us afterwards and he said, you know, that's awesome. Thank you for preaching that. But also remind people that they can forgive themselves now too. If you're struggling with forgiving yourself for whatever you've done, Jesus says, stop. <laughs> if I forgive you, that, then you can't not forgive yourself. You are forgiven. Every time we receive this meal, it transports us to that moment where Jesus was crucified. And also, here's the amazing thing, is Jesus doesn't want us just to sit there. He also wants us to think futuristically. This is what he says. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus says, this is my last supper with you guys. But one day, after this whole dying thing, after I rise from the dead, one day my Father's gonna make a brand new kingdom where everything is brand new, no more problems, no more sin, no more pain, no more relationship issues. Brand new. And you and I get to sit down with Jesus and have a cup of wine. How cool is that? We get to look ahead. And so every time we receive the Lord's Supper, it's that beautiful picture of sins gone, paid for, forgiven. But also, and this is something I, I tend to forget, and I'll just say it, but now think futuristically too and say, Jesus, I can't wait to have dinner with my friend who loves me, the Lamb of God. And this is why the Christian church today, all throughout the world, in, in churches where they speak different languages and have different cultural norms, but they cherish and they treasure this amazing gift that we call communion. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for knowing us so well and knowing that we need to hear we're forgiven in so many various and different ways. We're so grateful for the Lord's Supper communion where we are in communion with you when we receive your body and your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, Lord, forgive us that uh, some of us have neglected this supper um, and for various reasons. But Lord, put it on our hearts to receive this as often as possible so that we can hear that good news from you time and time again. It's in your name we pray, amen.